War is as old as time. For as long as humans have roamed the earth, they have waged war against one another. The unending competition for limited food, shelter, and resources, driving mankind to use force against his neighbors in a harsh world where only the strongest could survive. In fact, archaeological evidence shows that even before humans created the first civilizations, they were engaged in armed tribal conflicts with rivals, their ancient, scarred, and broken bones betraying our eternal thirst for violence in the pursuit of material gain. However, since these prehistoric conflicts predated writing by as much as 7,000 years, no accounts exist which document the struggles and turbulence of our deepest past. It wouldn't be until as recently as three and a half thousand years ago that the first reliable and detailed account of the battle was recorded. What is now widely viewed as the first battle in history, fought between a young Egyptian pharaoh and a coalition of vassals that had risen up in rebellion against him. Following ancient Egypt's unification around 5,000 years ago, the first pharaoh unleashed his armies upon Canaan, a kingdom in the Levant that encompassed modern-day Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. Canaan was a loose confederation of city-states that had grown rich and powerful due to their strategic location along highly lucrative trade routes that bridged Egypt with Mesopotamia and Anatolia, lands which represented the height of human civilization in the region. The pharaoh coveted these wealth-laden trade routes, and following his successful campaign against Canaan, Egyptians established control over the area creating several vassal states led by pro-Egyptian puppet kings. The Egyptian empire now stood as one of the most powerful states in the world, its control over vast swathes of the Levant, providing a defensive buffer against rivals, while at the same time generating vast sums for the royal treasury. Yet such profitable lands were also coveted by the other great powers of the Near East, who watched on with envious eyes the Mitanni and Hittites working tirelessly behind the scenes to stir up unrest and undermine Egyptian influence and authority. Egypt's authority over Canaan gradually eroded over the centuries, and by the time Pharaoh Thutmose II passed away in 1479 BC, whispers of outright rebellion began to spread. Thutmose II's royal wife and half-sister, Hatshepsut, ruled as regent for the late pharaoh's son, Thutmose III, a boy who was born to another queen, and who at just ten years of age was considered too young to take the throne for himself. Breaking with tradition, Hatshepsut overstepped her authority, and essentially became the new pharaoh herself, forcing Thutmose III to impatiently endure a long wait until his stepmother and aunt finally died in 1558 BC, some twenty years later. Thutmose III had spent his youth receiving extensive military training from the finest warriors and strategists in the kingdom, this martial upbringing instilling him with a militaristic outlook on the world and an unrelenting desire to restore Egypt to its former glory by forcefully subduing its rivals. The new pharaoh dreamt of leading his armies on the battlefield, his obsession with proving himself to the world, no doubt fueled by having spent so much of his life living under his aunt's shadow. Shortly after being crowned, Thutmose III would be given the perfect opportunity to show exactly what he was made of. Believing the new pharaoh to be inexperienced and weak, the vassal rulers of the Egyptian province of Canaan entered open revolt, hoping to take advantage of the new pharaoh's transition to power to finally throw off the shackles of Egyptian domination and reassert their independence. Led by the king of the Canaan city of Kadesh, this anti-Egyptian coalition quickly gained support from other regional powers who were keen to use this golden opportunity to strike back at their old rivals and check the growing power of Egypt once and for all. The kings of Mitanni and Megiddo threw their lot in with the rebels, the coalition confident in the strength of their mighty city walls and security of their ever-growing numbers. The king of Kadesh assembled the coalition army of some 15,000 warriors at the fortress city of Megiddo and prepared for battle. The city of Megiddo was perhaps the most strategically important and easily defensible location in Canaan, 
It dominated the main trade route between Egypt and Mesopotamia, and its imposing fortifications overlooked a fertile valley that was ideal for supplying and sustaining a large army. The odds were certainly against the new pharaoh Thutmose III, however losing such a valuable possession was simply unthinkable. Megiddo had to be retaken if the rebellion was to be crushed. Thutmose III showed no hesitation and sprung into action, personally leading his army of between 10 and 20,000 men and chariots against the rebel forces. Departing Thebes, the Egyptians made the grueling 150-mile, 10-day march to Yehem, where a critical decision awaited the young pharaoh. From Yehem, there were only three paths the Egyptian army could take to Megiddo. Both the northern and southern routes were relatively safe for his army to pass through, however they were indirect and would add days to the march, losing valuable time and giving the rebels longer to prepare their defences. The central route was far shorter, however it snaked through a narrow mountain ravine that would require the army to march in a single file formation, resulting in the vanguard reaching the plain in front of Megiddo while the rest of the army was still marching through the ravine. If the rebels blocked the central pass exit, they could destroy the thinly stretched Egyptian army as it emerged piece by piece, rather than having to face its full might head on. Thutmose summoned his war council for guidance. The senior generals present unanimously agreed that the central pass was simply too dangerous to consider. The ambush they would almost certainly face at the route's exit, sure to result in the destruction of the entire Egyptian army. Yet Thutmose refused to listen to his more experienced advisers, concluding that if his own seasoned generals were advising him to take one of the easier routes, then the enemy's generals would anticipate such a decision, for surely no sane strategist would dare risk everything by taking the dangerous central pass. He decided that the best strategy was to do the unexpected. The pharaoh would gamble everything and lead his men through the risky central pass. As the pass was so narrow, the Egyptian chariots had to be dismantled and carried by the soldiers, the men marching in single file as they passed through the tight ravine, dreading what lay ahead and expecting the route's end to result in their certain death. Yet the pharaoh's gamble paid off. The rebels were certain that the Egyptian army would take one of the other safer paths, and had thus dispatched a large portion of their army to block both the northern and southern routes, leaving the central pass woefully undefended, the pharaoh and his forces easily destroying the handful of scouts camped at the route's exit. Caught by surprise, the king of Kadesh rushed to assemble what remained of his forces on the plain in front of the city of Megiddo. However, the once mighty coalition army he had earlier gathered was now a heavily depleted shell of its former glory. His decision to split his army and block just two of the routes now coming back to haunt him as the pharaoh's army descended upon the city. With the path to Megiddo open, the pharaoh gave his enemies no time to prepare, rushing forward and setting up camp just outside the fortress of Megiddo. Outmaneuvered and now in disarray, the rebel army didn't have enough time to position themselves well enough to take advantage of the high ground outside the city. The battle that would decide the fate of Canaan was about to begin. The pharaoh arranged his army in a concave formation consisting of three divisions, using the two wings to enclose the rebel army and threaten their flanks, while Thutmose personally led the centre division forward against the enemy. The speed, size and ferocity of the Egyptian attack stunned the rebels and utterly smashed their will to resist, and as news of the swift collapse of the left wing cascaded through the rebel army, the lines buckled and broke into a rout as panic and fear ran rampant. Those who could fled into the city of Megiddo, the terrified men promptly closing the gates behind them in a desperate attempt to keep the pursuing Egyptians out. However, the selfish panic left large numbers of their own men stranded on the battlefield outside. A testament to just how swift and utterly complete the rout that Moser inflicted on the rebels was, can be seen in the low number of casualties inflicted, with just 83 hands said to have been cut from the dead as trophies. 
While the true number of casualties would have been higher, the fact that only 83 of these grisly trophies were taken points to the battle being a relatively bloodless affair. The ancient Egyptian record of the battle further amplifies this point, stating that the enemy fled within the walls of Megiddo upon seeing the pharaoh leading his army against them, their faces described as being full of fear. Such minimal resistance from the rebels is hardly surprising. Facing a much larger Egyptian force than anticipated, taken by surprise by the pharaoh's unexpected and sudden arrival through the central ravine, and with a large number of their own men still miles away, even the kings of Kadesh and Megiddo are said to have ran for their lives. However, like thousands of the men they commanded, they found the gates to Megiddo firmly shut. The total destruction of the rebel army was now within reach, however this golden opportunity to smash the rebellion once and for all was squandered, as seduced by the sight of the hastily abandoned rebel treasures strewn across the battlefield, the Egyptian soldiers halted their pursuit of the enemy and set about gathering as much plunder as they could carry, allowing the remainder of the scattered rebel army to escape to safety. The undignified manner in which the kings of Kadesh and Megiddo were able to escape along with the remainder of their beaten army is recorded in great detail by the Egyptians. These men who had just minutes ago dreamt of becoming independent kings in their own right, now reduced to being hoisted up and over the city's walls by its inhabitants, using improvised ropes made from items of clothing that had been tied together, the sight of them dangling precariously in mid-air, no doubt providing the watching Egyptians with much amusement. With the main bulk of the Canaan army now safely inside Megiddo, instead of attempting to breach the city walls and capture the city, Thutmose opted to lay siege, the young king once again demonstrating wisdom beyond his years, as he no doubt understood that no preparations for a siege had been made by the rebels, and as such the city was woefully low on supplies with which to feed the large army now residing within its walls. Instead of wasting the lives of his soldiers on a costly all-out attack, he would patiently allow hunger to win the siege for him. The city was carefully surrounded by defensive earthworks and enclosed within a wooden palisade, ensuring that nobody could escape. After several months of slow starvation, the rebels surrendered and prepared to accept the pharaoh's judgement, no doubt certain that their lives would be forfeit. However, in an act of generous mercy, Thutmose spared everyone in the city so long as they promised to never again raise their swords in rebellion. The ringleaders were stripped of their positions, with new, more loyal officials appointed in their place, their children taken back to Egypt as hostages to ensure that they would not be tempted to break their word in future the shrewd pharaoh ensuring that these children were given an Egyptian education and essentially indoctrinated to embrace Egyptian culture and thus grow into loyal adults. The Egyptian victory at Megiddo solidified the pharaoh's control over the entire region and its lucrative trade routes as rebel state after rebel state surrendered, Thutmose III's reign ultimately seeing the Egyptian empire reach its greatest expanse. While the battle fought at Megiddo was relatively unremarkable in the way it unfolded, what made it unique was its documentation. Thutmose III brought his personal scribe with him on campaign, the account of the pharaoh's victory taken from the meticulous journal the scribe wrote, eventually being carved into the walls of the Temple of Amun in Karnak, the ancient stones preserving the tale of what was the first recorded battle in human history one that would set the standard for the many battles to come in the centuries that followed. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you again soon.